Hey guys, Derek here, what's going on? And if you've been following our journey and our videos here on YouTube, you know that we've been doing a, a number of interviews recently. Uh, and most recently we've been interviewing a number of uh, successful folks, small business contractors that have actually won their first government contract. It's been a, a total blast working with them. And I wanted to continue on with that interview vantage point. And we have a number of, of really great resources in our community Recently, I reached out to see if anybody has a contracting background because not only do I want to shine a light on folks who are having a success so that they can share that with others and inspire others to do the same and you know basically narrow that gap. Um, I wanted to bring in some folks from contracting and we have Robert here with us today who comes from contracting, I believe, all the way back from 2013, Robert. So you're yes. rounding out a decade here in, in just a, a couple of years here. Um, I'm gonna be asking Robert a number of questions that I think is gonna be hugely beneficial to those of you who are small business government contractors or are looking to get into the game. Um, we're gonna be talking about Robert's history, his current role, and even some fun questions like, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see you know, being made on RFP or RFQ submissions? So stay tuned for all of that. But Robert, um, I think we can just get started and get everybody up to speed on you know, telling a little bit about yourself and your experience in contracting um, up to today. All right, absolutely. Uh, so right now, actually, I am a project manager at FEMA. Uh, official title is Program Analyst, Contract Management Oversight. Before that, uh, I was a contracting officer at FEMA. So kind of give you my history from, uh, and I'm retired Army. I was infantry, a recruiter. But uh, in March of 2013, I got accepted into uh, the United States Army uh, program to basically learn to be an 1102, a contract uh a contracting series, but in the United States Army, they call it 51 Charlie. And what that is, it's an acquisition, logistics, and technology contracting non-commissioned officer. It's identical to an 1102 series, just the military Army calls it 51 Charlie. Uh, and I was an enlisted soldier. So I got training for about two months at Lackland Air Force Base. So I worked with the Air Force doing that. Uh, it was a great experience. Yeah. Then from June 2013 to June 2016, which a correction, June 2013 through August 2016, I actually worked at the Mission Installation Contracting Command in Fort Hood, Texas, right outside of Colleen. Uh, don't believe all the rumors you see on, uh, on TV and the media. Trust me, that, that place is different. However, it's a great place to work. I enjoyed it, but I bought everything from, contra uh, from supplies, services, uh, construction, everything from cost reimbursement contracts to firm fixed price. Nice. So I've done over 400 contracts when I was there. So a wealth of experience there in three years. Uh, I got medically retired from the army. So I was like, well, what's next? I have a, a master's in emergency disaster management. Well, I went to FEMA uh, up here in Denton, Texas. So I was a specialist and a contracting officer from August, 2016 to August, 2018. I uh, did two years there, deployed to multiple disasters from Hurricane Harvey, um, Man, there's a multiple disasters I've supported right. as well. Wealth of knowledge and experience there. But then I went to the Army Corps of Engineers from uh, August 18 and 19, and I did environmental contracts. We're talking multi-million uh, to $50 million contracts where FEMA was very minute and small dollars. Uh, then August 2019, I came back to FEMA, and I'm a program analyst. So where I sit today, I am... I tell contracting what we want to buy. That's what I do today. And then in short, it's basically like being a project manager. You develop the requirement and you go through the whole entire process and the quality assurance side. But I will speak more on that. Sure. sure. You know, absolutely. And, and thank you. I mean, guys, just a, a few things that I want to highlight that Robert just went through. You're watching this, you know, over 400, you know, contract actions just out of that one, one location down in, in Mick, uh, Fort Hood, I believe you said. Yes. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, that's huge. And, and not only do these folks in contracting um, just, you know, I know some of them will just, for example, specialize in construction, but that's not what Robert's saying. He's been kind of all over the board, all the way up to an environmental contracts from a 1 million to 50 million. So guys, if you're trying to win out, go out and win your first, you know, government contract and it's like 200,000 or something like that. Um, you may think that's, that's big or, you know, a lot of peanuts or whatever. Um, it, that's 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 like pennies. I mean, and, and nowadays, right now, with simplified acquisition, I mean, everything underneath simplified acquisition, with that being raised, like it, it's you know, I don't I don't even feel like contracting bats an eyelash at some of those procurements. 
Um, but just know like that the sky is, is really the ceiling of what's possible with your business. Really, it's, you know, ultimately down the road, your long term plan where you want to take it. And as you can see, Robert just, you know, since 2013, all of these contract actions he's been involved in um, just so many. And, and I don't know if they were all with small government contractors, but I bet you probably more than half of them them were. Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert. You're right. Majority of them are small businesses that start out and they grow into big businesses. Or like the big thing at the core of engineers, you saw joint ventures, mentor protege programs. Yeah, yeah. And that's where that new company disabled that economic disadvantage went on business. They find a large company or a small business that's been around a long time and building that revenue and they do a joint venture. So they can go after the bigger contracts and pass performance. And so when it comes to past performance, it's usually looked at over $250,000. But what I, what I tell everybody is find your sweet spot. Know, know what you want to go after. Because I know some companies that only do a million to five million type dollar contracts. Yeah, absolutely. Some companies say, I'm working $250,000 and below. Yep. Uh, it's based on your company and your comfort zone. I absolutely love that. I'm so glad that you went there. Um, guys, if you're listening, you know, take notes on that. Know what your spot is. It means you got to get good at your pricing in that zone. And it means... You're going to be able to do intelligent capture management, looking at bids, uh, things like that, instead of kind of going after everything. So I could talk about that for a half an hour, but I'm not going to to kind of keep us on track here. Um, but thank you for getting us up to speed and, and all of that. Um, I'm super excited you know, to have you with us. Uh, but to keep things rolling here, uh, I know that you mentioned FEMA. FEMA's, you know, kind of wh where you're graduated to at this point. Um, could you just talk to us a little bit more, I, I think, about your agency specifically, since we got you, I think we would be remiss to not focus on FEMA a little bit about, you know, the mission of the, the agency itself and, and even opportunities as you see them for small business contractors, folks that may be watching this video. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, I agree with you 100%, but let's let's talk about, I think this may be, I want to definitely dive into that, but I think one of the most- sure, take, take it, man, take it, yeah. Uh, so yeah, sorry, uh, prior infantry, I'm, I'm, uh, and, uh, uh, you're alpha male, I'm an alpha male, we're aggressive. So, uh, <laughs> so one of the things that uh, I want to talk about is my roles and responsibilities. Got so it. in my position, and this is every agency has individuals like me in a position, we're in charge of a program office or a project management office. So basically my current role is when I showed up to FEMA in this new role, I look at my annual spend plan. This is what I'm buying for the whole entire year. So, but then I look at my life cycle management. Now, life cycle management could be computers, desk. Uh, so basically, when does the life cycle expire? So now I do a projection of one year to five years and then a 10 year plan. So my job is to sit there. I sit in front of my finance section and we discuss this. So to kind of run you through this process is yeah. that, and this April, I'll, just, I'll tell you right now, this April, and majority of agencies are around the April timeframe, they're going to sit down with their budget office, just like I am, and going to go, hey, what money do you need next year? And I'm going to sit there and go, I need this much amount. And they're going to be, eh, be a little more specific. <laughs> on my so here's my current contracts. I got this and this and this and this. This is what I have in place. Now, a contract for supplies and services and construction. So usually we're talking services right now. I have these services in place, they're usually what's called a base and four-year options, total of five years. Uh, this contract's at three years. This one's at two years. This is one's at one year. Well, guess what? I already know what my budget is on all my service contracts this year. Ah, this contract is going to expire. Well, it's going to be competed now. So you can go you know, to FPDS or Beta Sam or USA Spending.gov, and you can find out when contracts are expiring. So I know when's ex when it's expiring. So what I'll do is go, I need to develop a new acquisition package and let my budget office know this is the approximate amount of money I will need for this year uh, to make sure that I make the budget this year. So that's how that works. So what ends up happening is I have that rolled up. I get with my boss, my supervisor, and I go, hey, uh, this is what I'm tracking this year. Is there anything new that may have come out? And he may be like, hey, we got a construction project. We got two construction projects. You need to develop a plan for it, uh, develop the budget. Or he may be like, hey, you know, we don't need this service anymore. Get rid of that. Okay. Oh, we're going to buy these supplies this year. Uh, budget for it. So this April meeting, I tell them what I'm budgeting for. By August, September of 2021, I will know what I'm spending 
from October 1st all the way through uh, September 30th uh, of 2022. 2022. Yeah. And guess what? Every, every office does too, just about. So when, you know, you call them and tell them, oh, I don't know what we're buying. Yeah, they do. Yes, they do. The majority of the time they do. Uh, so that's a situation that I, I work with. But I can also tell you in my new fit, my, my fiscal year, my new year, I know my first quarter is October 1st to December 21st. Why is that important to you? Well, I know money's dropping that time. I know what contracts need to be exercised. Second quarter is January through March. Third quarter is April through June. And the final quarter is July through September, which has the highest spending. Yep. So you look at all those quarters. Well, my market research starts 18 months prior. I'm already tracking what's going on even a year prior. So as I'm doing this market research to develop these phase lines of when budget will fall, I, I know when it's going to happen. And I know when it's coming out. This is where the pitfall happens. My acquisition package is done. This is what I want to buy. I have the funding and it goes to contracting. Yep. The issue that happens is contracting gets the package and they have to say, is it a complete package or is there stuff missing? And then they, what they do is provide you what's called a procurement lead time. And I can tell you for this dollar range, it takes 50 days, 60 days to do. From this dollar range, it's 180 days. If it's above 50 million, it's going to take 280 days. So you got to look at how all this stuff gets backwards planned to see when things will come out. So super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that, but that's why I share with everybody. So when people give the agencies call and they say, I don't know what I'm buying. I'm like, yeah, you do. This, yeah. this is, this is brilliant. This is brilliant information to be sharing. Please continue. Okay. So we're going to talk about life cycle. And every agency is different. So like computers and monitors, they're good for three to five years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, audio sense. visual equipment, it's good for five or seven years. Furniture is good for 10 years, depending on your agency. Uh, and then also carpet replacements are good, good for every 10 years. Things get replaced. Fiber optics, I saw that at, the, uh, at uh, in Fort Hood, Texas. So all this stuff, you got to look at the life cycle. So if you're trying to sell furniture to the government, I'll be, I'll be honest, Veridesk. Are you familiar with that company? No. Okay, Very. They're the stand-up desk. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So Very, okay. Very is a great company. I'm not pushing them to be bought or sold. But I, I talked to them a couple years ago, and we saw this huge trend. Just, oh, man, they were selling and they were doing great. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, we looked at the trend the last couple of years, and they did this. Why? Well, it's very simple. Life cycle management. There's not a need. It's already been bought. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just yeah. the way it is. It's been satisfied. That makes sense. Wow. And so where these companies try to call and go, hey, I want to sell you my furniture. Look at the life cycle. When's the last time I, this, this specific location bought furniture? Are you wasting your time? Let me let me ask you something. I think this is maybe a, a good a good a place as any to ask this, and um, it's coming from something I've heard a lot of. But uh, it was an objection that was brought to me, and it's going to sound you probably have heard it, but I, I sound almost silly saying it. But I'll just say it. A lot of contractors feel or have heard that if one of these requirements you're talking about, um, with you know even being in the life cycle and everything, um, once they reach beta SAM or you know, say it's on GSA eBuy or one of these procurement platforms. Once it reaches there, it's already too late for them. Contracting has already made up their mind who they're going to give it to. And I know there's so many things wrong with that in terms of uh, you know, proc procuring in the pr procurement process that contracting just cannot do. But can you just say two seconds about your thoughts on that? And I pretty much can guess what you're gonna say, but right. I think others need to hear it from someone besides me. I just I, okay, so I've heard that too. Uh, relationships matter. They already know who they want to buy from. I'm gonna tell you 50 50. And the reason why I say 50 50 is very simple is that being on both sides, once I was at the Corps of Engineers and they had a preferred vendor or an incumbent they wanted it to go to, and you have two, you have two sides, it's a fiscal triad. You have two sides to this you have project managers and they have contracting. There's integrity in there, and the end of the day, it's it's not about who you prefer. It's, who provides the best evaluation, the best technical, uh, who has listened to the, read the instructions and provide the best proposal. That's what they need to evaluate against. And so in my experience, there is no professional treatment. I disagree with it 100%. They don't know who, the government may know who they want to buy it from. For example, they're like, I want this individual to win it, but that's not, not the way it should happen. So if you sit there and you see, drawings or uh, schematics of a certain company 
Well, guess what? They helped them build that requirement. And so what you do, and my recommendation to any company is you call that out. You tell them, hey, this is proprietary knowledge from another company. They helped you build it. And you're going to say you're going to protest. I'll tell everybody the same thing, mm-hmm. government or civilian. The reason why is FAR Part 9 has, a, a, what's it called? Uh, it's where companies uh, are too involved in procurements. And I can't think of the correct term off the top yeah. of my head. I'm familiar but, with that. Say again? Okay. So they have too much knowledge. And so, yes, they're going to have a lead on everybody else. And so, I mean, you can call it insider trader, insider knowledge. It's procurement okay. integrity. So you call it out from the start and you put it out there in front. And yes, you may protest it. Trust me, the agency, and this is my not my experience at FEMA, but I've seen this throughout because I do some consulting work on the other side. And I've seen where company, where the government will prefer one company and I've seen it. Uh, I'll be honest, I've seen it at the Veteran Affairs. I'll just tell you how it is. I saw that a lot there. Sure. Uh, FEMA, not so much, not so much of the Army at all. Uh, but yes, it does happen. It does occur. But there are, there are some great contracting officers and project managers that do agree with you got to provide the best proposal. Does it happen at every location? No. Got it. Love it. I love it. And, you know, I, I've seen it, too. I've actually I've seen it at, at Army. I've seen it at Big Army. Um, contracts that we were going to go after. Um, my boss didn't really know how to handle it. For those of you who are watching, you know, um, just so you know exactly what Robert's talking about. He's talking about a company, a small government contractor, a large, whoever, um, a, a contractor, say they're incumbent and they're doing the work, um, or maybe it's a new requirement, but contracting is either working with them as an incumbent, or if it's a new requirement, maybe they're working with them to help develop the requirement, maybe help write the pure performance of work statement, or you know, even you know, include some of the drawings and schematics, depending on what type of requirement is, you know, services or, or some sort of project-based requirement. When contracting works too closely, for those who are paying attention, um, if contracting works too closely with another company, you can pretty much see that that yes. company had a lot to, even to the writing standpoint, saying kind of here you go and then you do your thing and then post it. Um, it, it makes it an unfair advantage for other, to, to basically um, promote competition, which is what contracting is supposed to be doing all the time. Um, they're basically creating something uh, that is designed for a company to win it in a way that only this company will be able to satisfy a technical yes. response or something like that because it, they they're saying hey we need this done in a certain way and maybe the, that company is the only way that's capable of doing it it's not fair so if you pay attention and you see that you call it out uh, right at, at at the get go like Robert's saying but then you also you know I don't know if you let them know but you you can always fall back on a protest um, however you want to, to handle it but again we're we're answering the question. Uh, it's not all figured out. Once it reaches beta.sam or GSA eBuy or whatever, that doesn't mean you should not be responding to it. There is little games like that that we're discussing that do happen, but majority of the time at most agencies, it doesn't. It's something that you can be on the lookout for. It is kind of industry specific also. Um, it's yeah. kind of hard to see something like that for a, a new construction job or something like, you know, GC is a GC is a GC. You know, we all got to use the same trades, for example. Um, it's harder to get away with, but I love that. Thank you. I think there's a lot of value in that for our for our viewers. You also see that with project managers that help build the requirements. They may work with a contract or not. So you'll see it on both sides. The other thing is that uh, the Department of Justice has a uh, integrity uh, procurement unit. So if you see it, you're allowed to actually email them and say, hey, this is the issue that I'm having. And you bring it to their attention. And that's they are very responsive. They're publishing on it. Uh, they're not going to disclose everything, but they are right. definitely working to get rid of that. Is that they, kind of like the equivalent of like the inspector general, but on a bigger age, agency level? Yes. Since it's right out of the DOJ. It's out of the DOJ, you know, because like I'll tell you, there's one agency, uh, one contract I'm working with on a state level. And we've sent it to the state. Well, guess what? The state's blowing it off. Well, now we're, we're sitting there with the uh, uh, DOJ to get involved and things are changing. So trust me. And I'm going to caveat that is an agency is going to sit there and say, well, we hired this company or we're trying to gear it toward this company. If they don't win it, what is the fallout? What may occur? Is there other hidden things that have occurred that's illegal? Kickbacks, bribes. So what do we really lose on this? I mean, this this can be a conspiracy theory, rabbit hole we can run down, (laughs) but it occurs. It's rare. I'll tell you, it's rare. It's not as much as everybody thinks it is. 
Got it. And and not that I want to go down it further, but um, getting into things like, and this is different, but uh, yeah. directed awards and sole sources that are, you know, for example, not 8A requirements, but truly only one company can perform that. Just yeah. to be clear, that's not exactly what we're talking about here. That that does exist and justifications have to be written and it has to be proven. I know a number of you know members of our audience are familiar with that. They may be saying, you know, well, what the heck, what about that? That is something that is different. That also too does exist. Um, I don't know all the intro workings of that, other than I know a, a a justification definitely has to be you know very much figured out to pass something like that through, especially uh, if it's over simplified acquisition procedures. Um, but but that exists too, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole. But in case anybody was wondering that, that's yeah. also something. Sim different. Simply put, what you're saying is that the agency has a requirement. They've done the proper documentation to validate it. It's been approved by multiple individuals, legal, and it's blessed off and approved. That sole sourcing is legal. What we're talking about is the, the contracting officer goes, hey, I'm giving it to this company, and they don't document. That's yeah. illegal. Yeah, the paper trail. Oh, saying, this is going out on betasam.gov or Global Unison, and it has this company's logo at the bottom of the drawings, and they get awarded it even though you provide a cheaper product, a better product, and they still get awarded. It. That's what we're talking about, the illegal actions that do occur. Absolutely, well well put. I don't think I need to add anything to that. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Beautiful. Um, do we do we want to, uh, I think we've specifically covered roles and responsibilities, unless there's anything yeah. else you want to add to that point. No, we're good. Um, cool, uh, I think then we can move on more uh, talking about FEMA. Um, anything that contractors should know, we kind of have talked about a number of things uh, indirectly, which I absolutely love. Um, but anything else we can go through on that roles and responsibilities or opportunities for contractors, um, yeah. let's let's get it done. Okay, so FEMA, you gotta look at two areas, okay? One, it's gonna be the garrison side. So this is like your military basis, uh, physical locations. Um, and then there's the disaster side, which is unknown, a disaster occurs. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind pulling up the, uh, the FEMA yeah. organization of the regions. So does this look right to you? That's it. Absolutely. So FEMA has 10 locations. You'll see the regions there, but then you also have headquarters in Washington, D.C. So it's it's really 11. Now, these 11 locations are physical locations that a FEMA um, office is at. So I'm familiar with Region 6 out in Denton, Texas. Uh, you got California. Um, Atlanta, Georgia, they're a physical location. So they're strategically, strategically placed uh, where minor disasters, large disasters do not occur to no. support the region. So basically think of it as headquarters, in Washington, D.C., running everything. And then you have minor locations in different locations to support multiple states. For an example, Region 6 is Texas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. That's the region they support. Got so, it. And this is pretty similar <laughs> if you know uh, about like, the VA having different visions. Um, I know they, they're broken down similarly, probably for different strategic needs, but it's still a breakdown. Absolutely. Can, so the, the way this works is that if it's a region disaster, uh, restriction, a region or a garrison contract that's needed, the way it works is that the program office develops it. And if you can open up strategic sourcing, This one? Yes. So this is called strategic sourcing. So before we get into this, I'm going to tell you kind of how it works on the supply side and also the GSA side, just real quick. When I look at supplies, I got to sit there and go, does the, does the agency have it? Can I find it anywhere else in FEMA? The answer is no. The next step is, can I find it in excess of any other agency? So I'm going to Department of Labor. I'm going to go out to uh, GSA, the Veteran Affairs. There's actually a website. Oh, GSA access. Well, I can see if there's anything out there. If I need tables, uh, if they don't have it, I'm going to then go. It's called the Federal Prison Industries. All right. And so that's basically uh, furniture. Usually, in my experience, I've never bought from them. A majority of people haven't. It. It's prisons that make stuff for the, for the government. Got it. Uh, the next step is called Ability One. These are individuals that are handicapped, blind, and they make equipment. They make items. So that's the list I have to go through to see who's buying it. Well, the next step usually is GSA. However, 
FEMA has a policy in place where it's called strategic sourcing contract. It supersedes GSA. So that's what this, uh, this right here is what we're talking about. So the biggest one I always hear about is IT. Can you, can you jump on the infrastructure one real quick? Click on that. All right here? Yep, that's the one. Click on, all right. All right, so now this thing was done back in August of 26, 2020. I'm gonna tell you, you may see 12, I think, on there. That, that list has actually increased to 31. Oh, wow. Yeah. So before I even touch GSA on supplies or even services, I have to go there first. Oh. I, have to, I have to go through there and get through every IT company and go, can you provide this or not? I have to do my market research to validate it. So if you're not on this list, trying to sell to the uh, FEMA at a regional basis or headquarters, you got to get through that list first. And, and I'm going to tell every company out there, good luck. Your best bet is to see if you can subcontract with them. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, that's that's huge. Yeah. So let's say I can't find it there. My next step's GSA. Uh, so you can you can drop that one down. Head over to head over to GSA or so, yeah, the next step is GSA. And so and I'm not gonna go too much into this. There's e buy market research and right. tools like that. The reason why FEMA uses this in a, in a garrison environment is we, we don't know when a disaster is going to occur. And uh, we have to sit there and see if these individuals can provide it and can we get the best price. Now, there's exception to both those. Can I get it cheaper or if there's a policy around it? And it has to be approved by two levels above me. And, and the other reason why they use this FEMA recontracting is very short staff. Right. And so that's. That's the quick and skinny on, you know, if you're currently in FEMA or if you're trying to do business with FEMA at like a headquarters or one of the regional locations on that website. Yes. Those are the hurdles you're going to have to go through. You'll have to monitor Global Unison and also uh, Betasam.gov for those opportunities to come out. And we'll talk about disasters further down. I'm actually going to walk sure. you through a disaster. Okay, no, that'd be awesome. And, and I also just want to point out, um, looking at this this visual here, I think is is great. I'll, I'll come back to our uh, stop sharing my screen now for for a minute. But I think what is is huge is that, and I, I'm sure you would agree that different agencies, even different sub agencies, offices of primary agencies, they all have their own different way of doing things to meet the missions and to get things mm -hmm. done that they need to do. Uh, what Robert's talking about in that list, I mean, that list was huge to be able to see. I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge about FEMA. I haven't done a whole lot with FEMA myself. Um, I've never seen that list before, but that's just the point. If you're going to, I always say target agencies that you want to do business with and do that intelligently based on who's buying the most of what you're trying to sell. That's kind of how I, you know, you can start by going to, you know, FPDS or, or a number of other sources to kind of follow the money and just, kind of get a sense of, okay, who's doing what that you want to do and, and who's doing the most of it? Why would you not start there? Once you know and you have a target, I always say have three to five targets to start throwing spaghetti at the wall to see who's going to be the best fit for you. And then based on the, the results you start getting, double or triple down on that. I mean, we got to start getting revenue for the business or winning contracts um, using that process. But what you just went through is, is very specific to how FEMA is operating and, and the lit down to the list. It's not going to be that exact list. It's not going to be that list at all, but it's not going to be that even that exact process necessarily at other agencies. All that to say, whatever agencies you're targeting, you got to get to know them. You got to get to know how they are doing things and you got to play that game. If you're trying to play uh, the game at a whole bunch of different agencies and chase everything, you're not going to learn how to play even one game and you're not going to be successful. It's like you're reading my notes further down and you're not going <laughs> to see my notes. It's, it's just like, like you're so page. Page. I, I love it. I, I, what you just you know brought up there, it was just a, such a huge case in point. Like, guys, if you want to do business with FEMA and you're looking at IT, just for, for example, or infrastructure, you need to know that exact game that Robert just pointed out. Otherwise, your strategy is just going to be wrong. So you need to take things to that deeper level. And I love it. So, um. I think what we can do is uh, we can either continue on with questions or if you, I know you mentioned we're gonna go through a, uh, a disaster. Did you wanna do that uh, right now or did you wanna save that for later? 
We'll say that later. We can continue with um, responding to a solicitation. Things that yeah. this will go into the disaster side yeah. and that makes sense. So yeah, one of the one of the questions, something we touched on at the beginning, is what are you know essentially some of the the common mistakes, things that you see contractors are getting wrong or or not doing when they're responding to RFPs, RFQs. I agree. This is a good segue because hey, you know, if you're developing your strategy, once you have that in check. Now you got to start getting the numbers game up, which is, you know, at, at some point you got to start taking shots. You got to start responding. Um, and, and that means, you know, sometimes jumping in the deep end of the pool, knowing you're going to, you know, maybe mess something up or just not be perfect. But if it means doing that or not starting, it's always better to just try it. But uh, over time, you, you need to start getting feedback from contracting, you know, do FOIAs or, or whatever you need to do to, to enhance your responses yeah. from, from your standpoint, Robert. Um, you have the microphone. What are you seeing um, in, since 2013 or, or specifically the last couple of years? Oh, man, I could, I mean, yeah. And yeah this, I'm sure you could. I've been at FEMA, Mission Installation Contract and Command, in the Army, also the Corps of Engineers. I have my own uh, cons man consulting management business. I work with other contractors throughout the U.S. and I've helped them. It's been FEMA approved, by the way. Oh, I can help them do certain things. And I've helped them develop some of their requirements or thought process strategic management and how to go after some of these. And when we look at it, we're like, no, that's not a good fit. And you're hitting it right on the head. So the, the common issue that I see is, and it's the most common mistake is that agency, or sorry, contractors fail to read the instructions. Yeah. Uh, they're not reviewing the whole solicitation. And so when they do bids, they think it's like commercial and they go, uh, here's my pricing, good luck. And that's all they do. And it's like, no, there's a lot more to it than just pricing. And so, what I tell everybody is review your expertise and you've hit this on it constantly. You've got to know what you're selling to the government. You've got to, you know, so when you get that solicitation, you're reviewing it, you're going through the statement of work, PWS, statement of objectives, and you go, all right, this is what they're putting out. This is what they want. That's an error. That equipment's outdated or that's not efficient. That law's five years old. It's been replaced by this law. You're the expert. Trust me. Yep. Project management, man, I work on, I have stuff on generators, audio, visual, facilities, heating, air conditioning. I'm not the expert. Oh, it's, yeah. all it's all over the place. I'm not the expert. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling from something that's already been done before. And that's mm -hmm. everybody does it unless they have the experts. And they sit there and go, okay, this has been done before. They call up to head, higher headquarters and go, hey, you bought this a year ago. Let me see your template. That's the expertise that I'm getting. So now I'm going forward to industry going, hey, this is what I'm putting out. This is what I want. Review it, well, your industry. Go through it and tear it apart. Every area you see, make all, make all your notes. And what you're going to do is you're going to ask questions. You're going to make recommendations on what needs changed because you're trying to move this to the most advantage, advantage to your business. So what I would also recommend, though, is you're the subject matter expert in this specific area, okay? Electro, electrical, construction. Yeah. Well, I know you and I, that's not our area of expertise. We're experts in contracting. We understand how to write it. We know the laws. We know the court cases. We know how to look at protest. Is it geared to our mm -hmm. separate company? What I tell companies to do is build your teams. Grab, these, grab a second person that's an expert in this area like yourself and have you review it. Have you come up with your ideas? And I'm going to tell you right now, I was working on a other transactional OTA with the agency. I was helping another company. We were talking, you know, doing some education, walking them through line by line how this works. And they just basically took parts of the FAR, provisions and clauses, copied and pasted in their other transaction agreement, removed the FAR parts. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is a firm fixed price solicitation. But they removed all this stuff. I mean, it's just horribly written, okay? And I, yeah. I, get, I get frustrated. Yeah. But that's why you have an expert go through it so you can sit there and say, this needs fixed. This needs removed. <laughs> Ask the questions. Sure. Wait for those answers. Why? Because it's going to help you understand the instructions to you guys as businesses. You're going to better develop your price. You're going to, you know, ask the question, who is the incumbent? Yep. Who's currently working it or did work it before? Get the contract number, the task order number. Guess what? That's your price point. You already know what it was bought for before. Right. So you, you can sit there and look at it and go, okay, this is at $1.5 million. 
I'm coming in at 1.8 million, for example, and the technical valuation is based off price, technical performance, and past performance. Mm -hmm. But price is most important. Guess what? I'm not bidding it. That's I'm not going to do it because the incumbent's already coming in cheaper and they already have stuff in place. They already have a stronger you know, uh, approach too because they've been the one who's been doing it. <laughs> exactly. So that's a business practice and a business decision to determine, is this the right way to go? You need to look at the CLIN structure. So if they sit there and say one year, and it's not a subscription or service or subscription where they can pay you up front uh, after the first month, well, guess what? You're going to be waiting a whole entire year to get paid. You need to change that to 12 months where you're invoicing every month. So that's just an idea. I love this so much because it's, I think it's, it's definitely something nobody talks about because most folks don't even get into this level of depth, which is why I'm so grateful you agreed to, to jump on this interview. But uh, putting the, the onus on the contractor, um, and, and this is something, you know, people are afraid, they're overwhelmed. You know, a lot of folks are new, they're looking to get into this, having the level of confidence to kind of dig their heels in a little bit. And not, not I'm not saying necessarily push back, although there are times for that and it's not pushing in an aggressive way it's in a constructive way to contracting because as you said the contractor is the expert you're relying on market research you know at the very beginning stages and even you know all throughout to say hey you know is there something blatantly wrong with this has something changed in the industry from five years ago that us mm -hmm. in contracting need to update and maybe go back to our customer and say hey they're doing things they don't use that anymore they don't do things that way anymore um you know in, in contracting you're almost in some level, a middleman to be able to talk to a customer and then talk to those who can, uh, you know, do the work and bring that together to satisfy the mission. Um, but I really want to, everybody who's listening, eventually, sooner than later, I hope you need to get confidence. And in, in if something doesn't look right to you, let contracting know, ask the question, submit, submit the RFI um, at the very least. And if you don't necessarily agree with the way something's being proposed to be done, um, propose propose an alternate, do an alternate proposal, um, things like that. You you can dig your heels in. You have more say than you think you do. Yes. Um, and it it's only going to benefit everybody. So don't be afraid to to open your your mouth. You know, if you have a message to say, say it. Don't be afraid. It, it may. It may be what sets you apart. It may actually be something that is beneficial. It's not going to be like, hey, this guy's just whining or, or something like that. I don't think it really is seen that way. Um, so again, I'll, I have so many soapboxes that I stand out, but on this one, guys, we got to build up your confidence. And if you know what you're doing, then stand behind that and, and enforce it. No, I know. For me, when I see an RFI request for information from vendors, I respect it. Uh, I respect it on two levels. One, they actually read it. Two, I'll hear, I'll read oh, you're missing this. But I already talked about it in this section. When I see something that they missed, it could be simple oversight. Uh, mm -hmm. but I always tell companies, you know, thoroughly review the solicitation, but also if they're asking you to provide pricing information, ask for an Excel template. The reason why is because if they ask for a technical evaluation, ask them for a technical evaluation breakdown sheet. This is important because when I sit there and I look at proposals, I'm going, this company has all this stuff here. This company has all this stuff here. And it's everywhere. It's, it's chaos. So yeah. now, we're, you know, we're hunting to find answers. And trust me, the source selection team or the one individual reviewing it may miss it. So if you make the government provide you those templates of how they're going to be reviewing it in a certain order that they want it or the schedule, now you're all on that same playing field. And will the government provide it? No, it probably won't. But you always ask for it. You always ask for it because what you're doing is you're establishing yourself. One, you get free, free template. Who doesn't love that? Yeah, yeah. You use it on everything else. <laughs> Two, you're able to establish yourself, but you can also go, okay, they didn't provide me a template. What you're doing is you never want to protest the government if you don't have to. But you're prepping yourself for that last minute if you have to. Mm -hmm. And this is why the questions are very important to ask those. And and absolutely. I mean, um, it, and with the, the template, guys, that's when I say apples to apples, that's exactly what, what Robert's yeah. saying there. And he's saying you and, you know, 80 percent chance of that not working and maybe 20 percent of the time you do get the template. And, hey, that makes your proposal writing easier, too, if you get a template. But uh, enforcing things to be apples to apples or, or at least 
having a hand in trying to do that, it means that maybe something that they didn't call out specifically, but you put it in there, maybe it doesn't get missed or something like that, because now we have a structure where we're going line by line comparison, you know, in source, you know, source selection um, or, or what have you reviewing these requirements when you're essentially looking for reasons to throw something away. And it's like, oh, no, they missed it. Cool. I don't got to read the rest of this. I mean, I've heard a number of folks in contracting yep. tell me, you know, even down to a font and, and things, things mm -hmm. like that. Just, hey, we look at the beginning. We look for reasons to throw it away because essentially we're saving taxpayers dollars because we're not spending as much acquisition dollars to spend on, you know, getting this, this thing on the books. And the other thing is if the government has a preferred vendor that they want to go after and that source selection team wrote the requirements with the previous incumbent or the other company that helped them build it, guess what? They're going to look at every, oh, font size eight, man, disqualify, throw them out. Disqualify because of font size eight. Uh, wasn't I mean, we're talking minute things, yeah. it happens. And I'm not trying to discourage anybody from going after government contracts. you got to dot your I's, cross your T's. Yeah. Not every contract, specialist contracting officer or program office is bad. Uh, the rumors you hear, uh, they do occur. Small percentage, very small, minute, but they do occur. And it's, man, I just hate to say that's the way it is. And uh, But if you notice it, say something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, you know, for those of, you know, most in the community are new and they're learning, just just put in best practices from the get go. And and, you know, as Robert said, instruction to offers, evaluation factors, guys, you know, you've probably heard me say that a thousand times now when I read through bids live or whatever. Those are the first sections that I go to, you know, as a contractor, because I don't want to waste my own time mm -hmm. reading. I, believe it or not, I don't enjoy reading through 100 page RFPs. I really don't. Um, I want to go to section L, section M, instruction to offers if they got a separate document. I also want to see if they have some sort of pricing template to see, hey, can I even make sense of this thing? And, and what is the procurement strategy? Is it going to be LPTA? Is it going to be best value? Is it going to be something else to say, hey, is this aligned with what I'm able to be competitive with? Again, that sweet spot. Is this in align with my sweet spot? I can find that within 15 minutes. And it's a skill, you know, because I know it takes some some folks that are new, they'll spend hours going through these and reading, but uh, you'll get there and within 10 to 15 minutes, you should be able to discern, okay, you know, what's the strategy on this? What is my response going to have to look like? Do I want to do uh, like four binders and, and mail them in? Or am I going to say, screw it? Cause I don't want to do that. Like you can gauge all that very quickly. And also you, you can see what's going to be required of you. Like the most important parts. You can come back later and go through with, you know, the statement of work with a, a fine tooth comb when you're putting your pricing together, things like that. But it's this high level information that you need to be able to quickly extract. Um, and I think it goes hand in hand with exactly what you're talking about with anybody who's afraid of putting responses together. They don't know, read the instructions. Okay. The government's not going to tell you to respond to something and not tell you how to do it. If you have questions, ask them. Yeah. Um, also, I agree with you on section L M. Uh, the first thing I always look at, set asides. What's the set aside? Oh, right? yeah. that's, that's <laughs> I have that's one company that's yeah. bid a woman-owned small business. It was a set aside for a woman-owned small business. And we're evaluating, and I, I grab their Dunn's number, and I go into sam.gov. I know where you're I'm going. Like, They're not a woman-owned small business. Yep. They yep. waste so many hours developing yep. it. Yep. A small business. That was a set aside. So I agree with you, but... Always look at the set of sides. <laughs> yes, do that first and response date. Make sure it's not due tomorrow or yesterday. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, awesome, I love it. I think there's so much value in what we just talked about. Uh, I know we're gonna get blown up in the comments with so many great feedback on that. Um, I do wanna talk about the anatomy of a winner. Um, yes. uh, do, you, do you want to go straight into that or do you want Let's to- Let's go to winners. I mean, we all wanna be winners. I mean, we're, we're headed that way, yeah. So. Um, what are you seeing? Uh, and if you have a beat on contractors, you know, at FEMA or any of the other places you work who are successful and are doing things right, you know, they've got momentum, they've got the snowball effect, they've got synergy going for their business. I'm sure contracting has some pulse on that versus um, contractors that maybe you see them, you know, respond. And we kind of just talked about it and you're like, they don't even know what the hell they're doing or, or whatever. Um, what are some things that can help our listeners that you see as, you know, common threads? as you know common factors that would you know define the anatomy of a winner that so they can start you know practicing some of those skill sets and knowing that when they're focusing on these things that they're focusing on the right things 
So the anatomy winner, uh, from my experience, is they understand their value. They understand their, that money is time, time is money. They understand their capabilities. So when they sit there and they see a source of thought, they respond because they're trying to gear it toward them. Uh, if the government asks for pricing, be very straight to the point. Don't sit there and add, do a full blown thing. Uh, you just just enough information to get your answer across. Yeah. So the winners that I see, they're not, they're, they're not the ones calling me going, give me a contract. Hey, I'm an 8A. Hey, I'm a hub zone. Give me a contract. No, those, those people aren't winning. Uh, I'll tell you from Fort Hood to FEMA to the Corps of Engineers, the ones that were winning, I saw bidding contracts, doing proposals, doing quotes. They were doing it. Uh, they would show up at site visits, do questions. They were involved. And, and this is and and this is this is kind of I call it the secret sauce. If you're an 8A and you can be sole source, I don't say hub zones, I don't say civilian yeah. disabled veteran businesses businesses or WOSB. Guess what? Everybody can do what you're doing. They're nothing special. All right. There's plenty of them. But if you're an 8A, I know as a government, we can sole source to you. But I see that you're coming out to all, and this is Fort Hood when I was in construction. And I sit there and see you coming to site visits and you're doing uh, proposals and bids, yeah. but you're losing. And it's at the end of the year. And I'm like, man, I have to get this off my desk. Guess who I'm calling? I'm calling that guy or that female because they're showing up. They're not begging me. They're performing. Even though they're not, I mean, they're missing yeah. by a couple hundred dollars, a couple of thousand, 20,000, whatever. Maybe even a couple million. Uh, but the government has to turn yeah. it fair and reasonable. Those are the individuals that are winning. And when I hear that, it's all about relationships. Yes, relationships do have their place. I, I will say that they are there. But you're talking, you're the incumbent. You're, you're already doing the contract. Two, you help the government build it, which they should not be doing in accordance to FAR Part 7 at all, but it occurs. Yeah. And, and number three, um, the contracts are under $25,000. We're talking low hanging fruit here. The reason why I say that is because if it's under 20, so a service, $2,500 to $25,000. Uh, construction, $2,000 to $25,000. Supplies, $10,000 to $25,000. I do not have to post it on betasam.gov, global unison. I can pick up the phone or write up the uh, request for a uh, quote, not me, but contracting officers email it over to three vendors and go, hey, give me a price. And guess what? Those are the only three people competing for it. And there, and that's that's low hanging fruit. And that's where the relationships do matter. And I saw this a lot in construction at FEMA Region 6. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just personally, I've seen it. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that because it's in accordance to the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the SAR, and the SOM. It occurs. Isn't there even, to, on that point, oral solicitations, a, a certain threshold where oral solicitations can take place? Ooh, ooh, very, that's it. <laughs> <sighs> I don't have any experience in that, but I have seen it written in place. Oh, man. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> my friend Kamina, he works at L3 uh, Harris uh, down in uh, Dallas. Uh, him and I would joke about this at FEMA, uh, sorry, oh, at, at Fort Hood, Texas. Yes, far part five. <laughs> this one talks about oral solicitations up to $150,000. But then you go to four part 13, you have to document you're doing an oral solicitation. This is why it's advantageous. So yes, a contracting officer can call for up to 150,000. Now that's what the FAR says now. Will it change to 250,000 in accordance to the SAT? Yes, it will sooner or later. Uh, you'll see it in disasters. I've never done it to $150,000. I could see that as a supply buy. But as far as services, it would have to be emergency right there on the spot or construction. Very rare. But you're right. Uh, that's why I was laughing because not many people know that. But it, yes, it can be done. And I, was, I only brought that up to make an extreme example to illustrate the point that you were making that, you know, going to three, they're the only three that, that are seeing it. And it, it will still be written and what have you. But it's like relationships matter. And to your point with, with the 8A, um, it's not all about the 8A, but it's like, are you showing up? Are you doing all the things? And hey, you're you're not winning. Like, hey, I, you know, contracting may throw you a bone. I mean, uh, I'll share with one of my, you know, kind of more extreme examples to further illustrate this point. Um, PA National Guard, uh, Mechanicsburg. Um, I went out to do a firing range uh, site visit. 
we were the only 8A that showed up for it. I think you can probably guess what ended up happening. Oh, by the way, this is the end of July. End of July. Um, before I left that day, I also reviewed four other sites with my construction manager. We ended up sole sourcing four out of five of those within three weeks from then. I mean, it was madness trying to quote all that and going back out, but uh, they needed a, a solid company that was showing up. The contract vehicle was in place with the 8A sole source. Um, and if I wasn't showing up, I just would have never had that opportunity. And so, no, I don't always expect something like that to happen. But if you can put yourself at the right place at the right time, be professional, jump through all the hoops. Don't just be calling and only calling, say, hey, give me a contract that makes you you know, look like you're not professional. Um, do it. Show it, as you're saying. And sometimes extreme things can happen. I mean, it was huge. You know, and each contract was uh, between, I would say, 100000 and 500000 but we got four of them. So we had over a million dollars of contracts uh, in addition to everything else we had going on that year. It was huge. All right. I mean, we, we, we knocked that one out. Let's see here. Uh, so, yeah. Um, let's, let's actually walk through a, a FEMA disaster. I think yeah. that's going to help out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can share my screen again, too, if that's what yeah. you'd like. We're going to talk about uh, Georgia Tropical Storm Zeta. Okay. Uh, that's disaster number 4579 in Georgia. I'm going to tell you, it's actually active right now. I have nothing to do with that disaster. Uh, I was asked to do this, you know, training with you guys, give you some guidance. And so when I, I was like, well, let's walk you through a real example. So now up right there, that's perfect. So in that you have a disaster that's occurring. So disaster occurs. And so in the brown area, that is the declared locations of a disaster. So, so that's where your local area set aside is going to go in. But we're going to talk about this. So I'm a contracting officer, and let's say I'm responding to this disaster. I know according to HASAR, which is the Homeland Security Acquisition Regulation, 3006.302-270. There's unusual and compelling urgency. This is the period from when the disaster kicks off up to 150 days. 150 days. When I was a contracting officer, I was allowed to sole source to make sure that disaster is taken care of up to 150 days. Now, the regulation states, if I can do competition mm -hmm. uh, or put, uh, so we're looking at local area set aside. Local area set aside are only those counties that are brown. So if I, let's say I need security guards and I put security guards in, in place for 60 days. And within those 60 days, I can compete a contract with only those individual counties. And I'm only going to look at security guards in those counties. Now, let's say only two or one is available. You know, can you still source? You may justification, approval, contracting officer. That's dependent upon them. But let's say there's only one company that can do it. Let's go with this. There's three companies. Well, I'm not going to compete those three companies in those brown areas. That's it. That's a local set area set aside. And FEMA disasters are the only one that's able to do that from my knowledge. Now, Let's say I look at those brown areas and I go, man, there's only one contractor that can do it. I'm going to go to the whole entire state of Georgia now and see if those security guards, I need security guards to perform that. So what happens is you're going to compete it that way. So depending on the disaster size, there's different levels and where the contracting officer will be at. Sure. So like, uh, Hurricane Harvey, you have a joint field office, which is huge. It may get pushed down to an area field office, which is a small, minute area. So you may have the big field office up in northern Georgia, a couple of smaller area field offices throughout. And then you're going to have what's called a DRC, Disaster Recovery Center. And so you might have one in each county. And so you may have the SBA, the Small Business Administration there. You may yeah. have the Department of Health there. FEMA supports those offices. So the way that works is... They must must sit there and say, do we have any government owned facilities we can use? It's a simple yes or no. If it's no, they're going to go to GSA and look for lease property. We're going to try to lease property in those areas. And then once we get the property, we have to look at public utilities. Now, this is this is where everyone wants to pay attention. All right. And so if this Georgia disaster is happening right now, your company's in Virginia. And you're not playing ball here. Don't don't call FEMA. You're wasting your time. Uh, if you're in Alaska, you're wasting your time. Texas, you're wasting your time. So this is about knowing playing the game. And so at disasters, they're all the same. It just depends on are they small, are they bigger? 
Do we have a public assistance mission that's supporting businesses and structures? Or do we have individual assistance? That's people's homes. And so what happens is the government will lease a GSA lease building. They'll get public utilities put in. They're going to get dumpsters put in. Well, now they're going to have to have fencing, security guards, portable toilets, and janitor services, internet, cable, satellite. Uh, they're going to go into, let's say there's a staging yard. You're going to need light towers, all-terrain vehicles, forklifts, pallet jacks, day laborers. I'm going to have to publish legal notices in multiple languages. Uh, for example, in Houston, there was a small place that uh, was very predominant uh, Chinese. Well, guess what? They had to publish a Chinese article just so that they were aware of it in their community. Uh, yeah. And pastors are big. And I, I did this for Hurricane Harvey. So policy says that I have to go through strategic sourcing, GSA, through this earlier stuff to get what I wanted for Hurricane Harvey in Texas, for example. Uh, I did a local area set aside because there's small businesses within those counties that can do it, just like here. So let's say this was a big disaster and I needed computers, furniture, okay. uh, keyboards, scanners, desks, cabinets. I'm going to those small counties to see if they can provide it, those small businesses. Uh, that's who they're going to. And they're looking at individuals that are in SAM.gov first. That's okay, what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you that for the process. So you're, you, of course, you're going to start out looking at entities that are registered in SAM. I mean, you can't really start anywhere else. Exactly. Now, the good thing about local area set-asides, and in FAR Part 6, it says this, I believe it's also in 4, you do not have to have a SAM.gov to bid on government contracts at FEMA if it's a disaster. Mm. I'm going to tell you, it's a world of pain because I've been that contracting officer that's had to deal with that. What will end up happening is FEMA will sit there and come back and say, hey, we're not going to pay you until you get a DUNS number, until you're in SAM.gov. Got it. So, yeah, I'm going to catch up with you. I mean, I'm going to prove you to do it ASAP because it's not going to be bid well for you if you start doing work and then you start getting invoices piling up because you didn't mm -hmm. jump through the rest of the hoops. Okay, got it. Yeah, and then, and then, I mean, that's all the stuff that I'm talking there's small mission stuff. There's yeah. actually, this is where the money's at. And I'm going to tell you, it, you know, at FEMA contracting, the money, the money is that FEMA needs recreational vehicles, mobile homes. This is a, called a housing mission. Hurricane Harvey, and there's a couple other places that have that as well. Uh, they need to rent out RV parks, apartment complexes, or um, or a home, mobile home sites, you know, and that's on top of buying the mobile homes. But on top of that, we have to stage it. Now we have to transport it. Guess what? Those are contractors. Yeah. Then they have to do the maintenance on them monthly. Then they have to transport it back when it's done. And then FEMA is either going to sell it or they're going to keep it in inventory. So those are the big things that FEMA buys. Got it. And I think that's, that's so eye-opening from the standpoint of almost just using a bit of common sense as you just went through, well, hey, if we're going to need this, we're going to need that to support that. And then we're going to need this. And then when it's all you know done and over with, we're going to need, need to do this. So contractors can kind of use a little bit of common sense and um, expert knowledge in their industry to kind of, you know, talking about life cycles and everything again, to kind of almost in, anticipate and just learn like, Hey, what's going to make sense. They're going to, that's what they're going to need. Exactly. And I, I'm, I posted that list uh, in the private chat to you. So you can publish that to everybody. I mean, we're talking on security guards, generators, light towers, ATVs, golf carts, which is rare, ATVs and golf carts are rare, but rental vehicles. Uh, I mean, you, I mean, I think the two biggest ones I've seen, copiers and shredding. Now, with COVID, those are going away. And who knows what FEMA's model will be a year from now because of COVID. Uh, I know a lot of individuals are teleworking. So, some are going to the office. But uh, some of where we used to have constant shredding occurring and copiers, well, they're not as needed as much because of the environment. It totally makes sense. And it's just a good example of, of being agile and being able to respond. And those who are prepared are best prepared to take advantage of opportunities when they happen. And I know COVID has been a terrible thing, but quite honestly, for a lot of small business owners, some of them have seen some of the best years that they've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I hear that again and again with, you know, a lot of the clients that I speak with. Um, keeping things, you know, kind of in, in the interest of time now, I know we have a couple questions left, but I kind of want to round it out. Um, anything that you, you know, that you think contractors need to do better or any advice or, or two cents 
Well, anything else that you would like to add to this? I would continue this conversation for three hours, but YouTube wouldn't like that. So um, I understand you have kind of a, a last thing here that. Um, okay, so, yeah, straight to the point. The last thing I'm going to tell every company out there that wants to go bid cover contracts, and we've talked about this, is one, know your capabilities. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, that, that's the two biggest things I will say. But learn to play the game. I mean, I can tell you right now, we all know how to play tic-tac-toe. We all know how to play checkers. Uh, some of us know how to play chess. But I can tell you, I don't know how to play bridge. I don't know how to play the campaign of North Africa or how to play uh, Magic the Gathering or even a game called Go. These are all very complex games. And they can these games, it's like playing Monopoly. All these games can last minutes to hours and days. So you have to understand the game. And every agency from the Veteran Affairs who's vets first. Every agency has a game and you have to understand that. So if I know I am bidding on contracts in Dallas, Texas, my game is this, and this is my strategy I would use. I'm a service company, I'm a construction company. Everything within a hundred mile radius of Dallas. Who are my city contract, city, state, county, and, fe uh, and federal? Who can I play ball with there? But then I'm gonna look at residential. I'm gonna look at uh, uh, the consumers. Why is that important? Because you're playing in your zip code, you're playing in your background, you're reducing cost. But you're also building past experience, uh, past performance and experience by staying in your location. Now, if you sell supplies, I sell it over the U.S., who cares? But it's about managing time and money and learn to play the game. That's the best thing you can do. I, I couldn't I couldn't say it any better myself. Um, and. I, I will we'll just bring it up for just a second because I know we we touched on it before we we hopped on our interview here. Um, what advice or what would you say to those contractors who are say looking to get into government contracting, start a quote unquote GovCon business, but don't have a business, don't really know you know what they're doing, don't they don't have a pricing model, um, they kind of just want to chase after everything or maybe do what's you know kind of easy or what what's considered best to do. Um, what would you say to those folks? Well. Wow. Uh, people chasing the GoCon dream um, don't don't waste your time. And what I mean by that is uh, there's two ways of looking at this. Yeah. Uh, one, if you're chasing the GoCon dream, do you already have a business? Do you know what your expertise are? Do you have the money to support that business because you're paying out of pocket first, and the government will pay you when either monthly or however how the contract is structured. So if you're doing a service, you submit your invoice at 30 days, but you're not getting paid till day 60 probably. So do you have the capital to do it? Are you an expert in that area? I'm going to tell you, I'm a great manager. And I sit there and go, I can hire anybody to perform a contract or anybody to perform this in my business. Any, anybody can do that business. However, can you manage people? Can you manage the money? And if the answer is no, don't sit there and just try to start a GovCon business. It, it's, it's, it's a very big thought process. And nothing's worse when you hire somebody to do something and they quit. And now you're... You can't perform it. So I would tell you, if you're looking at going after GovCon, go be an expert in what you're doing. Go run after the consumer side, people. Go run after residential, which is the properties. Go run after uh, corporate America. Go work with them. Go get your past performance. Become that expert. Then go play ball in government contracts. Because if you're relying on your set aside or you're relying on, on that area, you're a pass through and trust me, it does come to light and you're going to fail. Now some have been successful and congrats to them, but that's not a business motto. Uh, that, that, that's a fraud. That's somebody trying to be somebody that they're not become an expert at what you do. Use that to go after government contracts. Love it. I think you hit the nail on the head there, Robert. Thank you so much for doing this interview. It's going to help so many government contractors that are, you know, doing their research, you know, trying to evaluate, should I get into this? Plus the ones that are already in it that are kind of lost saying, you know, what do I do? Where do I go from here? I'm registered. I don't know what to do. I think, you know, clicking the replay on this video, there's a lot of golden nuggets they can go through and, and find. So again, thank you so much for uh, sharing all of your knowledge with us today. No problem. Thank you for having me, Derek. And uh, anybody that has questions, I'm willing to answer. And, but Hey, uh, everything goes through you. It's not this coming straight to me because I respect the relationship that we have and uh, this opportunity wouldn't be here without you. So I want to thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, we'll, we'll be in touch and thanks again. Hey, you too, Derek.